April 18, 2024, News Report 1. Politico reported that U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will visit China from April 23 for a four-day visit. The report stated that during his visit, Blinken will meet with senior Chinese leaders, but did not specify which ones, with an expected meeting with Xi Jinping. State Department spokesperson Ned Price said on April 16 that Blinken's visit is an important one and will focus on commercial and educational issues. Blinken will raise concerns about China's assistance to Russia in boosting its defense industry. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen had just completed a four-day visit to China on April 9, stating that U.S.-China relations have become more stable over the past year as both sides can engage in difficult dialogues. Blinken's visit to China is his second since taking office, with the previous one in June last year. His visit, originally planned for February last year, was postponed due to the spy balloon incident. During his visit to China in June last year, Blinken warned Chinese private companies not to provide material and technical support to Russia's military for the war in Ukraine. He stated that the U.S. had not seen evidence of China providing such assistance to Russia, but that China was considering it. Blinken said this time that China is providing extensive assistance to Russia, including tools, advice, and technical expertise, which not only helps Russia's aggressive behavior but also threatens other countries. Blinken has raised the issue of Chinese assistance to Russia twice during his visits to China, which has become a way for China to manage its relations with Russia. On the one hand, China does not break the window paper, and on the other hand, it continues to strike, thus influencing American public opinion. Xi Jinping must consider the consequences of this behavior when assisting Putin, as this is the American way. News Report 2 Voice of America reported that Jens Eskelund, chairman of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China, recently stated at a chamber meeting that tensions in China-EU trade relations could escalate into a full-scale trade war. Eskelund pointed out that if China and the EU continue in their current direction, trade conflicts are expected to occur, similar to two trains colliding head-on. He believes that one of the reasons for the China-EU trade war is that Europe cannot accept technological products being pushed out of the market due to high prices, which could evolve into an economic security issue. Another reason is that China has a comprehensive overcapacity, which will impact the global market in the coming years, including in chemicals, metals, and electric vehicles. Escalund emphasized that the trains have not yet collided, and leaders from China and the EU should sit down and discuss how to avoid a full-scale trade war. He pointed out that China and the EU are conducting various anti-dumping investigations, such as the United States' investigations into Chinese electric cars, solar panels, wind turbines, and medical devices, while China has initiated an investigation into French brandy, which is ironic. News Report 3 Reuters reported that during his visit to China, the German Chancellor announced on April 16 that China and Germany had signed a joint statement on cooperation in the field of automated network driving, allowing automakers to transfer data from China to Germany. This cooperation is considered one of the achievements of the visit. The German Automobile Association stated that this cooperation will save development and production resources, and China and Germany will jointly develop shared standards and rules to manage the data generated by automated driving. However, the German government stated that the cooperation has not reached a consensus and hopes that German and EU companies will make substantive progress in this area. It is worth noting that this cooperation is inconsistent with China's current data security policy. Last year, the Chinese government strictly limited the transfer of car data overseas and required car manufacturers to use domestic cloud services only. In addition, local governments in China have also restricted the activities of companies such as Tesla. Therefore, the signing of such a declaration between Germany and China has raised some concerns about data security. News Report 4 the Chinese embassy in the Philippines stated on April 18 that the gentleman's agreement signed between the Chinese government and the former Philippine government is not a secret agreement and requires the Philippines to comply. 
Duterte's spokesman Roque revealed that the former Philippine government had reached an agreement with China to allow stranded warships to be replenished at Rene I Reef, but the warships were not repaired. President Marcos of the Philippines stated on April 15 that Duterte did reach a secret agreement with China, but the new government had never seen the text or record of the agreement, which threatened Philippine sovereignty. In response to Marcos's remarks, the Chinese embassy in the Philippines stated that the gentleman's agreement, signed between the Chinese government and the former Philippine government is not a secret agreement. After the Marcos government came to power, China and the Philippines negotiated and reached a new model for transporting supplies to Rene I Reef at the beginning of this year. However, after the implementation of this model once, the Philippines stopped its implementation. The Chinese embassy in the Philippines did this to prove that the Marcos government knew about the agreement reached between Duterte and China. In addition, a spokesman for the Philippine Coast Guard stated on April 18 that the Philippine Coast Guard will participate in joint military exercises between the United States and the Philippines for the first time, with the task of patrolling and protecting Philippine fishing boats from harassment by Chinese Coast Guard ships in the exclusive economic zone and transporting supplies to Rene I Reef. In the past, the Philippine Coast Guard only patrolled in the exercise area to prevent external entry. In this exercise, the Philippine Coast Guard Special Operations Force will conduct joint and coordinated operations with the U.S., Australian, and French navies. News Report 5 Xinhua News Agency reported that Chinese Premier Li Keqiang attended the Canton Fair in Guangzhou on April 17 and participated in a roundtable discussion with some foreign business leaders. He stated that China attaches great importance to the Canton Fair, will review the export situation of the Canton Fair, and emphasized that China will steadfastly expand high-level opening up to the outside world, promote trade and investment liberalization and facilitation, accelerate the improvement of high-standard international economic and trade rules, continuously expand market access, reward high-standard open areas. According to Chinese media reports, the Canton Fair is crowded with overseas buyers, with 149,000 registered overseas buyers. However, videos on Twitter show that the Canton Fair venues are sparsely populated, with exhibitors chatting in the aisles. Some netizens said that the Canton Fair is crowded outside, but empty inside, and many exhibitors feel deceived. Some commentators believe that many Chinese cities will invite some people to fill the venue during conferences and meetings, and the attendees may be hired professional, meeting representatives, to make the venue look lively. News Report 6 The National Bureau of Statistics released unemployment data for March on April 18, with the unemployment rate for the 16-24 to 24 age group at 15.3%, unchanged from the previous month, the unemployment rate for the 25-29 to 29 age group at 7.2%, up 0.8 percentage points from the previous month, and the unemployment rate for the 30-59 to 59 age group at 4.1%, down 0.1 percentage points from the previous month. These data do not include students. If students, especially interns, are included in the statistics, the unemployment rate could exceed 20%. The youth unemployment rate in China rose to 21.3% in June last year, but the National Bureau of Statistics subsequently stopped releasing this data. It was not until December last year that the National Bureau of Statistics re-released youth unemployment data, but changed the statistical method, excluding students, so the data showed an unemployment rate of 15.6%. Additionally, the Hong Kong Census and Statistics Department announced on April 18 the unemployment rate for the first quarter of this year, which reached 3%, with the number of unemployed reaching 111,700. The unemployment rate in almost all industries has increased compared to the 2.9% unemployment rate from December last year to February this year. News Report 7 U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, Japanese Finance Minister Taro Suzuki, and South Korean Finance Minister Choi Hyun-muk held a trilateral finance ministers meeting in Washington on April 17 and issued a joint statement. 
The statement expressed serious concerns from Japan and South Korea about the recent significant depreciation of their currencies, and the three countries will engage in close consultations on the development of the foreign exchange market. Analysts believe that this statement indicates that the United States may have tacitly approved Japan's intervention in the foreign exchange market, and there is even a possibility of joint intervention. Strong recent economic data from the United States has led the market to expect a delay in the timing and frequency of interest rate cuts in the United States, leading to depreciation of other currencies. Since the beginning of this year, the Japanese yen has fallen 9% against the US dollar, and the South Korean one has fallen 7%. On April 11, the Japanese yen fell below the key level of 153 against the US dollar to a 34-year low. In addition, Pan Gongsheng, governor of the People's Bank of China, also attended the spring meetings of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank in the United States, where he met with Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell to exchange views on the economic situation, monetary policy, and financial stability between China and the United States. News Report 8 Voice of America reported that according to statistics from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, 52,000 Chinese citizens entered the United States through various borders illegally. Among them, 37,000 people entered the United States through the U.S.-Mexico border, a 50-fold increase from 2021. A large number of Chinese people entering the United States through this route has led to the emergence of a chain of Chinese immigrant industries, including some illegal ones. The first chain is the snakeheads in South America, who are responsible for bringing the travelers from Ecuador to the U.S.-Mexico border. These snakeheads usually charge between $100 and $800, and if including the cost of tickets, the fee could be as high as several thousand or even tens of thousands of dollars. The second is Chinese intermediaries who help process Japanese visas, enabling travelers to fly from China to Japan, then to Mexico, and then arrange for vehicles to take them to the U.S.-Mexico border. This route has the highest cost and could charge tens of thousands of dollars. The third is to pay for a U.S. address as a communication address and contact person, with fees ranging from $200 to $400. The fourth is to help travelers obtain driver's licenses, with written test fees around $200 and road test fees between $500 and $600. The fifth is job referrals, helping find part-time jobs, with intermediaries charging around $40 to $50, and if it's a monthly job, the cost could be higher. There are also immigration lawyers, who are needed if the travelers apply for asylum, and the fees could be very high even reaching tens of thousands of dollars. Some people act as intermediaries, and these intermediaries also take a certain commission. The entire route has formed a very complete industrial chain, which has become very mature. News Report 9 Hong Kong Economic Daily reported that in the first quarter of this year, Hong Kong transferred 9.2 billion Hong Kong dollars of its mandatory provident fund, MPF, from the Hong Kong and Chinese stock markets to the U.S. stock market. The MPF is the retirement fund for Hong Kong residents, who can adjust their investment strategies and portfolios according to their needs. The report also pointed out that residents also invested 1.6 billion Hong Kong dollars of the MPF in the Japanese stock market. Some netizens stated that after transferring the MPF to the U.S. and Japanese stock markets, they recovered the funds they had lost in the Hong Kong and Chinese stock markets in one quarter. However, data shows that in the first quarter, Hong Kong's MPF still had over 200 billion Hong Kong dollars invested in the Chinese stock market, accounting for the majority, but there were also some losses. News Report 10 According to Sing Tao Daily, Deng Zhongdi, the eldest grandson of Deng Xiaoping who withdrew from the political scene eight years ago, has recently taken on a new role and joined Citic Securities as a supervisor. Previously, he had planned to enter politics, but it seems that this path has been blocked. Deng Zhongdi is the son of Deng Zhifang, Deng Xiaoping's second son. Deng Zhongdi was born in the United States in 1985 and holds dual Chinese and American citizenship, although China does not recognize dual citizenship. 
Deng Zhongdi accompanied Deng Xiaoping on his southern tour at the age of seven, and there is a photo showing him next to Deng Xiaoping at that historic moment. Deng Zhongdi holds a bachelor's and master's degree in law from Peking University, studied at Duke University, and returned to China after working overseas for a period of time. The report also mentioned that in May 2013, Deng Zhongdi went to Guangxi and served as the deputy county mayor of Pingua County. However, in 2016, he returned to Beijing and did not continue in politics, but joined the Bridge Association of Beijing as a director. This change indicates that Deng Zhongdi's prospects in the officialdom may already be bleak. The report suggests that Xi Jinping is unlikely to allow the Deng family to play a role again on the political stage, as Xi Jinping has already fallen out with Deng Pufang. News Report 11 According to the Wall Street Journal, as of the end of last year, the number of people in China who have been included in the list of dishonest persons due to debt default has reached 8 million. This year, at the beginning of the year, this number has increased to 8.3 million, an increase of 50%. The report analysis suggests that Chinese people are mainly included in the list due to borrowing for home purchases. This year, the real estate market is sluggish, and many people who have lost their jobs are unable to continue to afford their homes, leading to overdue repayments and ultimately being included in the list of dishonest persons. Since October 2013, China has implemented a system for publicly disclosing the list of dishonest persons, which was implemented after Xi Jinping came to power. Once included in the credit list, individuals will face various restrictions, such as restrictions on taking exams, taking high-speed trains, taking airplanes, staying in hotels, etc., severely depriving them of their civil rights. The report also mentioned that there is a post on Jihu that lists 10 situations that people included in the list of dishonest persons may face, including having their houses auctioned off, having their pension funds deducted, having their Alipay accounts sealed, having their online assets frozen, etc. These people may also face restrictions such as being unable to start businesses, unable to travel for holidays, and their children unable to attend private schools. The highest penalty could be a seven-year prison sentence, essentially depriving them of their human rights.